Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. If you've been paying attention to recent events, you know that American democracy is in serious trouble. The powerful influence of big money in politics frequently undermines the will of the people. The Voting Rights Act has been gutted and voter suppression is once again rampant. And in the presidential campaign, the lineup of candidates in one of our major parties has proved to be a national embarrassment. We'll talk about all of this with my guest, Michael Wallman, author of a compelling new book about the long struggle to bring the right to vote to all Americans. It's called The Fight to Vote. Michael is also the president of the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law. Michael, thanks for coming in. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. So you wrote in your book that by the year 2015, American politics appeared pathologically dysfunctional. <laughs> that's pretty bad. That's on uh, a good day. <laughs> that's on a good day. Uh, what went haywire? What went wrong and, 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 and why? Well, it's a number of factors that gives me great concern about the direction of the democracy. Uh, when you look at the whole long history of the country, we've built a stronger and stronger democracy with wider participation. But there have been times when things have moved backwards. And my worry is that we're in a time of that nature right now. Uh, you start with the things you mentioned, the wave of new voting laws for the first time since the Jim Crow era that make it harder for people to vote in uh, dozens of states across the country. Mm -hmm. um, a, a very destructive new campaign finance reality right. ushered in in significant measure by the Supreme Court, <clears throat> which when it had its five vote conservative majority was very interventionist, very activist in knocking down democratic protections. Add to those new factors, first of all, the gerrymandering that, uh, and other challenges that make a lot of elections just not very competitive. You know, there's not really a lot of competition for office in most of these places. And then, on top of that, to add to the dysfunction, uh, you've got a sorting out of the political parties in the United States right. into one conservative party, the yeah. Republicans, and one progressive party, the Democrats. Now, in a lot of ways, that's a good thing because the parties stand for something. But we have uh, not had a system like that before, <laughs> and our constitutional order uh, isn't so easily designed right. to uh, that kind of thing. So it doesn't really seen, accommodate it very well. Yeah, and so you see this partisan uh, intensity of a kind we haven't seen in a long time in this country, probably not since the 1800s. Wow. So you mentioned gerrymandering, and I'm glad that you did. It doesn't get nearly enough attention. Uh, give us a brief explanation of what gerrymandering is and why it's so problematic. So what it refers to is the way you draw the lines for legislative districts. Mm -hmm. And in this country, the politicians, the elected <laughs> officials, one way or another, generally speaking, they're right. the ones who draw the lines. Right. And gerrymandering really means when those lines are drawn to benefit one party or another, maybe both parties, or for some special interest or special purpose. And look. This is something that's been going on since the very beginning of the country. Mm -hmm. In the very first congressional election, James Madison was running for the House of Representatives, and his bitter enemy in Virginia politics, Patrick Henry, <laughs> who was a, Henry was opposed to the Constitution, and Madison had basically written it. Right. Hen Henry didn't want him to get elected to Congress, so he drew a congressional district. The only part of the district that was sympathetic to Madison was basically around his house. <laughs> and uh, it was the very first election, and, and there was one positive consequence of that. They ran a war hero, a charismatic war hero against him, James Monroe. He had a British musket ball in his lung. <laughs> uh, and the swing voters in the district were the Baptists, who now they're a more conservative Force, then they were the dissident religious minority. <laughs> and they said to Madison, we're only going to vote for you if you change your position. Madison said there shouldn't be any amendments to the Constitution. Uh, <laughs> they said, no, we want a religious freedom amendment. There you go. And he flip-flopped, first great American <laughs> political flip-flop, and that's how we have the Bill of Rights. So with, there's been that kind of gerrymandering from the very beginning. But it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Look, both parties do it when they can, but lately it's computerized, and the Republicans have had uh, unified control of a lot of the state legislatures right. in these off-year elections. And so right now, it would be practically impossible for the Democrats to win the House of Representatives unless there was a gigantic wave 
right. uh, voter uh, turnout in their favor. And this is this is essentially because so the Republicans have taken control of so many state legislatures, right. and then um, it's the the people who con the party that controls these legislatures who get to draw the districts, and then they draw safe districts. Right. And the Supreme Court of the United States, it's very interesting. The Supreme Court actually doesn't like uh, this phenomenon, even uh, unlike something like campaign finance, where I think that the John Roberts majority has been very doctrinaire. They, they, they get what's wrong with this, but they haven't really been able to figure out what to do about it. Right. The good news is that in many states across the country, voters have finally begun to take matters in their own hands and create uh, nonpartisan commissions to do the redistricting. Let's take a look. Your book, it really is a wonderful book. I mean, it's a great read besides the fact that it's got all this fabulous information in it. But so let's take a look at the history of voting in America. Um, in the early days of the uh, Republic, it, it did white men who owned property, did they have an actual right to vote? There was no right to vote articulated in the Constitution, mm -hmm. in the original Constitution. Those words don't appear. Um, and it was considered more of a privilege. But the fact is, in these 13 independent states that right. formed this country, uh, they all had somewhat different rules, but basically it was white men who owned property. And uh, there were other obstacles but uh, the idea was that they would be able to vote. But These from, were rules uh, created at the state level. At the state level. Yeah. And, and the ideals of the revolution actually <clears throat> began to crack that, uh, crack that ice of, uh, of linking voting with property and wealth. Um, and, and actually, Ben Franklin in Pennsylvania led a working man's revolt to say that all men, all white men, and actually uh, all men should have the right to vote even if they didn't have property. Uh, and that was the first great breakthrough in the fight that we've had over many years to expand who, who could vote. That's what I was going to ask you. How did, what was the push to expand the right to vote from that first small group? Uh, during that period, so you have Franklin um, in favor of all men, or at least all white men, having the right to vote. There were free blacks in that era. Could they vote? In some states, yes. In some states, no. Uh, and later on, even in the states where they had been able to vote, that generally got taken away in the early 1800s. Um, and there was even one state, New Jersey, where women could vote at the very beginning. Is that right? Yeah, until 1807. And, uh, <laughs> they could vote and then they, well, they took it, was, it away? It was, it, 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 it's the kind of uh, craziness <clears throat> that you see with all of this and also charges of voter fraud. Um, there was a lot of voter fraud. And uh, in that case, men dressed up as women so they could Are vote in more than one election in New Jersey. <laughs> and so the New Jersey legislature, logically enough, disenfranchised actual women as opposed to the men dressing up <laughs> as women. <laughs> they so, disenfranchised the women. Exactly. To, but it was the men who were the offenders. Well, they they, they were right. too complicated to actually disenfranchise them. But there was this push with uh, new states coming into the union uh, settlers not as wealthy moving out in this democratic ethos and you had a, a, the first breakthrough for the democracy was the idea that uh, there shouldn't be a property requirement that right. that basically what we would consider the white working class ought to be able to vote and that happened in the 1820s 1830s uh, and and there began a, a time of massive voter participation, the first mass political party in the world, the Democrats, right. uh, and, and a real flowering of this ideal of American democracy that then got applied to those who were still excluded. It always seemed to me to be a, a tremendous leap um, from freeing the slaves on the one hand um, after the Civil War and then actually, or actually, I guess during the Civil War, um, but anyway, freeing the slaves on the one hand, and then actually giving black men the right to vote, which came pretty quickly after that. Right. Um, what pushed that? Because this was hardly an enlightened era. And you're right about that. And the, the great historian Eric Foner observes uh, that many nations ended slavery in the uh, 19th century, but only the United States immediately, or pretty close to immediately, gave the right to vote and full citizenship to the former slaves. Unfortunately, it was very short-lived in effect. Uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, and reflected many, many other uh, northern whites, and he was actually opposed 
to voting rights for former slaves throughout his whole career. Mm -hmm. um, and his first stabs at Reconstruction didn't, uh, didn't have that. But on this, as on so many other things, he, he began to change. And uh, two days after the surrender uh, uh, of the South, he gave a speech from the second floor of the White House. And he said, I've been criticized on this issue, and I uh, now believe the critics are right. I believe that we ought to give the former slaves uh, who've served in the military or who are educated the right to vote. It was a big breakthrough, and one listener at least heard him. Yeah. John Wilkes Booth was there and gasped and said, that means citizenship. That is the last speech he's going to give. And he actually tried to give... Booth the, said that's the last speech Lincoln is going to give. Because Lincoln had now come out for voting rights yep. for African-American men. He tried to get the guy standing next to him to shoot Lincoln on, on the, the spot. spot. And, he, and when that guy wouldn't do it, he said, well, I'll, then I'm going to do it. And it was two days later he went to Ford's Theater. Wow. Even then, though, it was so controversial. It was such an incredibly powerful... Um, symbol and reality of citizenship, the northern, uh, the northern electorate wasn't, wasn't interested. And pretty quickly, though, the Republican Party, which was, for most of our country's history, the pro-voting rights party, right. pushed it through in the 15th Amendment, partly for idealism and partly for partisan reasons. And there was a flowering of democracy in the South. Uh, voter turnout among black men was up to 90 percent. Wow. Hundreds of people serving in legislatures, in Congress, as governor or senator. And then, of course, uh, as you know, you had a, a counter-revolution in effect. The Klan and other violent groups uh, drove people away from the polls, and in cynical deals, the North pulled back. Right. And you had a suppression of, uh, of the black vote in the South, so that by the end of the century, practically no African Americans uh, were voting. And a similar thing, to a lesser degree, <clears throat> happened in the North where there were now immigrants filling the cities. They weren't Mexican immigrants, as we hear people talking about now. They were from Ireland right. or, or right. Uh, Italy, yep. and they were Catholic. And the kind of established institutions, the established blue bloods of the time were thought suddenly had some second thoughts about voting. And they made it a lot harder for them to vote, too. Things really moved backwards at the end of the 1800s, and that's the worry now uh, that we could be in a time similar to that. Another only, era where, right. Yeah, it doesn't only move in one direction. The, um, the advocates of uh, a woman's right to vote, many of them, were enraged when black men got the right to vote. So these are two groups that you might have expected to be allies, um, but, but they weren't. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, there was for a time an alliance, and Frederick Douglass, for example, was a great a a advocate of uh, not only abolition and voting rights for black men, but for women as well, all people. Um, but the 15th Amendment only addressed black men, and the women uh, activists of the time, interestingly and, and somewhat uh, shockingly to our eyes, they opposed the 15th Amendment in language we would consider really racist yeah. and, and uh, ugly. Some of the great heroes and heroines of American history. It's important as we talk about intersectionality and as we understand all the different ways that uh, oppressed groups are affected that history is kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. The women of the time opposed the 15th Amendment. Right. And the story of how women got the vote I think is an undertold story that even the people I work with fighting for voting rights don't really know. After the turn of the 20th century, there was this period of reform and revitalization, the progressive era. Mm -hmm. And people then saw the vote as a powerful remedy against the big new role of big business in, in politics and in the economy. They gave the right to vote for a United States senator in the 17th Amendment. And they dealt right, with, and initially senators were not popularly elected. Right. They were chosen by the state legislatures right. who were corrupt and were seen as in the pockets of the special interests. Mm -hmm. and it was their form of campaign finance reform. But the 19th Amendment doubled the size of the electorate in one fell swoop by... Uh, the 19th Amendment, Amendment being the one that gave the women the right to and vote. And the story is <clears throat> it was a creative uh, and innovative and, and really um, bold protest movement young women in their 20s mostly, uh, who some of whom had been in England as graduate students, got involved in the, in the suffrage movement there, came back and said, we're going to do the audacious thing and try to actually go for everything, pass a constitutional amendment. Woodrow Wilson, President-elect Woodrow Wilson, got off the train 
uh, the day before his inauguration and looked around and there was basically nobody. <laughs> this is in Washington. Yeah. <laughs> it was the Princeton Glee Club. That was it. <laughs> and they said, where are all the people? They were down on Pennsylvania Avenue. There were 5,000 women marching in a parade for women's suffrage. Wow. And 100,000 men lining Pennsylvania Avenue, a lot of them drunk because it was right. the inauguration. The men threw things, broke through the police lines and assaulted the women. Sent 100 women to the hospital and it was a big deal. The police chief of Washington, D.C. had to resign. Uh, public, massively publicized. Public opinion swung in support of women's suffrage. And, and of course, hearing that story, we think, well, that sounds just like Selma. Right, exactly right. And, and it was 50 years before. And so many of the creative tactics of nonviolent civil disobedience used by Gandhi or the American labor movement or the civil rights movement were first pioneered on the fight to vote for women. And we don't remember their names, Alice Paul and Inez Milholland. These are not people we know of, but this was not given to women. Women had to fight for it. And eventually uh, they won that constitutional amendment. Now they won that constitutional amendment in 1920, which was 50 years after black men got the right, right, got the right to vote. But you tell a wonderful story in your book about a fellow named Harry Byrne, who was an obscure Tennessee legislator. Tell us about Harry Byrne. Well, so they, it, was, it was hard fought. It was, they eventually persuaded Woodrow Wilson with pickets in front of the White House to support this. Um, the, the, the women's the right women to vote. Was, well, because was it was during World War I, yeah. and it was just too <laughs> hypocritical for the United States to say we want to make the world safe for democracy around the world, but suppress it at home. And uh, it passed the Congress. It was sent to the states, but... This is a constitutional amendment. Right. And you need uh, three-quarters of the states to, uh, to affirm Ratify, it. Ratify, right. And it was down to the wire. The southern states did not want the federal constitution telling them who could vote for all kinds of reasons, mostly having to do with race. Right. And it came down to Tennessee. <laughs> and the Tennessee legislature deadlocked. It was a tie. And they went through vote after vote, and the whole country was focused on Tennessee, and they finally had one vote. If Tennessee does not vote for it, it's, it's over. It's over. Okay. And this young legislator, <clears throat> I think he was 24 years old, named Harry Byrne, <laughs> sat on the floor in a cold sweat reading a letter from his mother saying, <laughs> be a good boy, put the rat in ratification. And he <laughs> changed his vote and voted aye. He was, he was opposed. He was opposed. And he was chased out of the chamber oh, by angry right. men and had to hide in the Capitol. But he personally uh, ensured the ratification and the right to vote for Isn't women. that something? It's an amazing story. It's, it's a wonderful story. Oh, my goodness. We all owe it to our mothers. <laughs> Be a good boy. Be a good boy. In 1965, after, a long, again, a long um, and terrible struggle, often terrible struggle, um, lives were lost. But in any event, in 1965, Lyndon, John Lyndon Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act. Uh, explain why that legislation was so profoundly important. That legislation and the other things surrounding it were the great breakthrough. That really guaranteed to all American citizens that period the effective voice in the democracy that they'd never had, that we'd never had. So as you know, uh, from the time of the Jim Crow laws through the 1960s, there was a massive suppression of the vote of African Americans in the South. Yeah. And there were some breakthroughs, some court victories, but it was basically still in effect in the mid-1960s. Uh, and the story of the, how the Voting Rights Act happened is an amazing American story. It was the courage of people on the streets and the savvy of people like Dr. Martin Luther King to lead the movement and put the pressure on Lyndon Johnson. Johnson had been a segregationist. He uh, eventually was very passionate about civil rights. Right. Uh, had pushed through the Civil Rights Act, but thought uh, that the Voting Rights Act would be too hard. He wanted to get the Great Society programs through to help poor people. Um, King said, we're going to bring a voting rights bill to uh, life on the streets of Selma. Uh, as you know, uh, it was when uh, the, John Lewis and others led the march yep. uh, on Bloody Sunday and were attacked on national television by the police and vigilantes. Uh, and there was a wave of popular revulsion. And Johnson f let the pressure build, wound up having George Wallace, the segregationist <laughs> governor, coming in yep. from Alabama to beg for federal help, and then went before Congress and said he was going to propose a Voting Rights Act. and. Uh, using the words 
of the hymn and the protest song, Johnson said, we shall overcome. Right. It was a great moment in American history. And it, unlike so many of these laws, that law worked. Voter registration rates in the South skyrocketed. You had federal protection uh, of voting for the first time since Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And you had a key rule, which is called Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which said that the states that had a history of discrimination could not change the rules without going to a federal court or the Justice Department for permission. Right. And that changed everything. Now, you had a big, the, not all the consequences were what people expected or maybe hoped for. You had a big rise in uh, African American turnout and representation. But the white voters of the South switched parties. Yep. And went from the solid South went from being the segregationist backbone of the Democrats to the conservative uh, force in the Republican Party in the South. Which is why the Republican Party today is essentially a white party. Right. When you look at uh, the turnout <clears throat> rates, it's very racially polarized in yep. the South. It had all kinds of interesting consequences, but you really had for about a half a century, the rules were roughly settled in American politics. It was assumed that everybody who was eligible to vote could vote. And only in the last 15 years has that been challenged with new efforts, once again, to make it harder for people to vote. So we only have a couple of minutes left, but in um, 2013, the Supreme Court essentially, essentially eviscerated the Voting Rights Act. So explain that decision and what, what was the rationale for that decision? So the case was called Shelby County versus Holder. And you're right, it gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act. It, it struck down, effectively struck down this Section 5. Right. Um, and the rationale that Chief Justice Roberts basically articulated was, uh, in effect, that was then, this is now. That voter turnout rates for black voters, he said, in the South are higher than for white voters. That you don't need something like this. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in her dissent, said, you know, if you're standing in a rainstorm and uh, it's not, you discover you're not getting wet because you're holding an umbrella. The answer is not to put away the umbrella because <laughs> it's not needed anymore. That's exactly. why it's been successful. And unfortunately, I do think that the, the spirit of that really ugly decision was articulated by uh, the late Justice Scalia from the bench when he said that the Voting Rights Act was little more than, quote, a racial entitlement. Wow. And you can hear in the tape the gasps. From yeah, the it's really a disgusting And, uh, you know, as if to prove Ginsburg right, within hours, states began moving across the South to pass laws or, enact or implement laws to make it harder for people to vote. In Texas, two hours after the decision, Texas put in place its voter ID law. Two hours. Two hours. And I'm, not, I'm actually for voter ID uh, as a general matter. I think it's right for people to have to prove who they are. I'm not for requiring ID that lots of people don't have. And in Texas, 608,000 608, eligible registered voters don't have that ID. And uh, that's a very mischievous law. That's the one that um, you cannot use your University of Texas student ID as your government ID in Texas, but you can use your concealed carry gun permit. Isn't that something? What a coincidence. I think the partisan uh, goals there are pretty obvious. Happily, a federal court uh, has, has said that's illegal and unconstitutional, and a federal appeals court has too, but it's still in effect. Wow. So that case, along with all these other cases, may end up at the Supreme Court, and that's one of the reasons that this nomination is so, so important. To replace uh, Scalia. Yeah. The, to, to have uh, that vote uh, be, be in question now could change America. Right. Um, Michael Waldman, the book is a fantastic book, The Fight to Vote. Thanks so much for coming in. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. Ronald Reagan famously promised in 1980 to cut taxes, increase military spending, and balance the federal budget. George H.W. Bush equally famously denounced Reagan's promises as voodoo economics. History proved that Bush was right and Reagan was wrong. Mr. Bush's son, George W. Bush, doubled down on Reagan's foolish economic fantasies with catastrophic results. George W.'s gigantic tax cuts, out-of-control military spending, and other freewheeling economic shenanigans 
helped drive the nation into its worst economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Has the GOP learned its lesson? You must be kidding. As the New York Times recently reported, the tax plans of the Republican presidential candidates would cut federal revenues by as much as $12 trillion over a decade. That would be a post-World War II record, leaving the Bush and Reagan tax cuts in the far distant dust. The rich, of course, always benefit from gigantic tax cuts. The rest of us? Well, we're left to do the suffering and clean up the disastrous economic mess. Today's GOP candidates are also promising, like Reagan, to beef up the military and bring all deficits under control. None of this will be a problem, as long as you believe in voodoo. That's all for now. See you next time.